Um, guys, next up, one of the best damn retail trading educators on the planet Earth, a great friend of Zinger Nation and one of my uh, personal idols, uh, Samantha LaDuke, is up next. She is the founder of LaDuke Trading and the CIO of LaDuke Capital. Samantha, how's it going? It's going well. Can you see me okay? Yes, everything seems to be in good work in order. Yay. All right. Happy Saturday. Thanks for organizing this yet again. Uh, yeah, we like doing it. We like doing it. We have a good time around here, uh, Samantha, and we love we love having you here with us. Um, for, for those that have not had uh, the LaDuke experience yet, uh, would you mind uh, introducing yourself uh, uh, and telling folks a little bit about what you do? Absolutely. I'm also um, sharing the screen in case that helps as well. But basically, um, I'm here to talk about macro to micro trading using options. And this is what I do. I want to just bring up something real quick before I get too far ahead here. One second. Forgive me. And while you're doing that, I'm going to answer some questions from chat. Richard Calloway, yes, we will be doing trivia. Uh, Richard also says, hi, Samantha. Oh. Um, and Samantha doesn't miss from David. <laughs> Aw, thank you so much. All right. So my name, I, I'm, I'm situated. I'm sharing the screen. Good enough. All right. So my name is Samantha LaDuke. I'm founder of LaDukeTrading.com and CIO of LaDuke Capital LLC. I am a macro to micro analyst, educator, and trader. So... I was just hearing some of your conversation about kind of the macro backdrop. Um, it matters, you know, market structure matters, especially regardless of uh, day or swing trading timeframe. So what I wanted to do today was basically give a little bit of a background of how I pull back um, and then zoom in and pull back again and basically choose options to uh, follow thematic um, ideas, basically. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, I am, there we go, I trade for a living. Um, I support retail institutional clients that do the same. Um, basically, I'm someone who wants to know why something is moving, not just, you know, technical low risk entries and, you know, stop and profit targets. I really want to understand what is motivation motivating that crowd um, of buyers or sellers and then be able to position um, either on a short, intermediate, or long time frame. And I do that for clients as well who want to understand the macro influences. Um, these are directional trades. So as definition, directional trades require volatility. So trying to get in there early to um, predict not only direction, but also when it moves, right? Because no trend, no trade. So that's my focus is to basically use risk-defined options so that I can capture directional trades across multiple time frames. And that's why I kind of put that out there. I'm a chase, swing, and trend trader. My focus is anticipating volatility. And it's very much across every asset class. So I don't just look at momentum uh, stocks. Um, I'm looking at currencies, bonds, commodities, cryptos, the whole, the whole world. And that's my backdrop. I like to use um, macroeconomics as Policies can absolutely dictate the uh, the economy um, and then drill down to the fundamentals. Sometimes they do matter. Um, they can really identify uh, extreme undervalued plays, which I like to uh, to use for trend trades. I'm definitely a technical analyst. In other words, pattern recognition is my thing. Um, I use quant, which is another way of basically saying money flow, whether it be big money institutional CTA type quant programs, um, that really are just automated buy and sell based on triggers. Um, or it's that retail, you know, ape um, phenomenon that has taken over, which is very exciting. Obviously, we're doing this um, boot camp on options uh, trading as, as a focus because options now lead stock trading, which is so cool. And by the way, you will um, might be interested to know that crypto is even bigger than options. So in any case, we'll get there. But for right now, um, that's kind of the backdrop. Um, and then I, I packed it all up into um, digestible morsels for clients. So I'm looking at actual trades and putting that together in the form of trade setups. Um, I deliver that across multiple products. So I have a trader education service which is uh, basically my fishing club. That's why it kind of says about your fishing club captain. 
Um, that's active traders, investors. I deliver all of my macro to micro analysis, and that's across, again, all asset classes. I do a lot of custom analysis for clients um, across multiple time frames. But for trend trading folks, think long haul fishing, think, you know, the whales. Um, that's why I created a big ideas product. So it does not include my live fishing room, which is literally a live trading room where we're, you know, really sizing up what's moving at the moment um, and doing a lot of that custom analysis. But big ideas are my durable themes. So I'll, I'll show how I use options to capture that um, a little bit further on. But basically, that's the, the big picture place. And then I also offer um, chartered fishing trips for uh, institutional clients. So they have more of um, access to me. That's the fishing club kind of feature, if you will, of that macro to micro analysis, education and trading. I also have a Discord product, which is wicked exciting. Um, this is something that I started for um, uh, the younger momentum traders. So I am, yeah, not uh, Gen X. I'm just going to put that nicely, but I'm not Boomer either. So watch it. <laughs> so I... <laughs> Hold on. I think I got to hide that. Right. You're going to yell at me. Did I do that? Oh, Neil, you called me out for it last time. <laughs> Good memory. <laughs> so I own a, a discord product and it's very fast growing. So young traders have come into the space, um, you know, COVID lockdown and all since really last March of 2020. And women signed up for more brokerage accounts than men. Totally wicked awesome. Right. So I want to be a voice for women. Um, and I do this professionally. So I, I, I just thought this would be a good idea. And it has been phenomenal. So I've added, I've grown the bench, the trading desk um, to include not just options, which I do, but lots more focus and handholding around risk management with which young traders don't necessarily do so, so well. They're kind of getting their sea legs. Um, I have phenomenal fundamental um, analysis. Uh, Aisha, it runs out of Dubai, a, a, a money uh, she, money manager. So, I mean, that flavor of actually assessing value um, and looking at the numbers is something that I think uh, young people also need to learn about. I'm more the macro um, and Archna does the advanced option tactics. So she's my partner in crime when we do um, more complicated option tactics. And we'll talk about that because they are my favorite for um, certain type of trading. All right. So I also because, you know, I'm easily bored. Um, I also have um, uh, an algo driven trade alert um, system, which is completely separate, just totally standalone. I have nothing to do with it. I've created it. I had it built and then it just runs in the background for anyone who's looking to um, look at those triggers intraday when volatility comes in, like the past few days um, in the market pullbacks in, in Russell. So it'll differentiate between the different uh, indices and ETF. So it's very cool. It's actually housed at VIG IO, V I G I O. Um, they're a fabulous um, new platform for um, traders who not only want to learn, they've got a fabulous options matrix. I mean, really, really check them out. Um, they, uh, how, they basically house my. Um, indicators, but they are doing trading games. I mean, oh, they're doing such cool stuff. Anyway, they're hip. Um, and yeah, they're not run by boomers either. So I, <laughs> and my last, last, last is I'm launching um, a brokerage trigger trade alert system for traders, which is going to allow traders to share their real-time trades in their real-time accounts. Right now it's hooked up to interactive brokers and TD Ameritrade. So it'll literally show clients um, every open trim and close position, no Excel spreadsheets, no I said, she said, it is done. It is an open live PL. So needless to say, Neil, I am active in the market and I produce products and services to um, support trader education. That's just definitely my, uh, my thing. So my style, though, of analysis is... Very macro to micro. So I like to, before I talk about, you know, style of options trading, I think it matters how a trader um, chooses to analyze the market. They've got to put it in a language that's comfortable for them. So maybe it's safe to stay 
in a particular discipline, technical analysis, you want to learn what you can about that. Maybe it's selling options. You want to learn, you know, income strategies. Maybe it's, you know, macro, you're looking for the big themes and you want to, you know, position, whatever. That's such a personal decision. And trading psychology to me is a personal journey. So I'm sharing my approach and then how I choose the options because you have to first start with the analysis and then you come up with the trade idea and then you def- you wrap it into an actual uh, trade setup. And in my case, it's it's options for the most part. So for me, this is that um, lens, okay? This pulling back that I kind of mentioned at the beginning of connecting data dots to predict price action. And um, that's my thing, by the way. So anyone, you know, who says, yeah, you can't predict. Oh yeah, I do it all. I do it all day long, every day. So my idea of predicting is to kind of use it like a camera lens. You zoom in, you zoom out, you're always readjusting the focus based on the new data. And this scanning and synthesizing of the market um, requires a lot of flexibility. So if I'm seeing a gamma squeeze in something, I want to alert clients. I want to be selective about what I'm actually chasing. I'm, I'm extremely selective on all three time frames. So that's why I'm filtering out the information. And, you know, basically I come up with a narrative to help clients predict future price. So data to me, all the data that we see out there, which is immense, you know, quantities of it, to me is like words and words, you know, they, they form sentences that that give it meaning. And then you got to arrange the sentences in some kind of order to tell a story and it builds and it builds and it builds. So it but it's important. You're building the characters. You're building the motivation. Um, you're building the suspense and then ultimately the action. So I use everything I can to figure out the future story that the market doesn't see yet. And this is what I mean by, you know, macro, it's policies lead price, credit leads equities, volatility reprices everything. Um, Earnings matter. You know, we've seen some phenomenal um, beats and then we've seen just pummeling, right? The Peloton recently and, you know, Roblox to the upside and Peloton to the downside and earnings matter. So uh, technically speaking, earnings, you don't, really have so much of an edge. It's tough. I much prefer before or after earnings, um, but for trend trades, I'll stick with it. But otherwise, unless I have a really strong edge for earnings, I typically wait until after. It's very easy to position or chase after. And I'll show you some examples of that. So my secret sauce though, really is intermarket analysis. And intermarket analysis is that intersection of art and science. And it's basically studying divergences. So some people call it fractals. I don't. Correlation, causation, I don't because I see it everywhere. So I'm looking again for that, you know, that uh, personality shift in the market um, that doesn't align with the norm. And then I kind of feel like that's going to be an outlier. It's going to become an outlier and then it's going to revert. So I look for those types of things. I raised three teenagers. So maybe that's why. But the 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 volatility comes into a play when it starts to act a little out of character. So that's basically um, why I say I'm, I'm into predicting. And that's really my job. So it, it's nice also occasionally I get asked, um, you know, to kind of share what my future predictions are or how I came to see something because basically I'm building that story. Sometimes it takes a while. Like right now I have an oil thesis that's been in place since uh, last year. It's not done. And I don't think um, it'll be done until probably March of next year. But there's lots of, you know, waves in the middle to trade around. So I'm building a story and then I can share that story uh, with clients. They get it every day, you know, movie bit by movie bit, like a private movie showing. Um, And then basically the... The, the encapsulation of that is a trade. <laughs> so, and that's why I say they, they take different time frames, chase, swing, and trend. And we'll talk about that. <clears throat> I'm going to have a little bit of my coffee because I haven't yet this morning. <laughs> You're welcome to it. And everyone really likes your pace. I'm hearing. I'm um, fast. 
I'm fast. I got lots to get over, get through, and then I want to have you know time for questions if there are any. Good. That's good. They told me to shut up. So I'm going to shut up. <laughs> all righty. All righty. Um, so this stuff I already put up there. You saw it. volatility. All right. So this is one example, though, right? So I am looking very much. By the way, I'm going to kind of go back to this. This panic with friends that was last year, I, I put this out as a really important thing. People say, you, you know, don't worry about timing on um, tops and bottoms. If that's not your personality, then don't. If it is, then go for it. I am absolutely good at timing tops and bottoms and a lot better at timing tops than I am bottoms. And here's why. The tops form divergences under the surface there is selling. I've now created indicators where I can absolutely spy that. But it took me years to figure that out. So then when I can figure out the divergences that are happening under the surface, that behavior starts to change, I can start to say, oh, we're going to at some point have risk off. We're going to have volatility. That reprices everything. This was one of those examples in February of 2020. I was absolutely hair in the back of my neck. You know, we're going to have it's going to happen. So I, I literally guided clients through that entire COVID crash. And I was with incredible conviction because I had seen the top forming everything, you know, it creates an air pocket of risk underneath and then boom, rug pull. And that's what everyone worries about, but it really doesn't happen that often. So don't get so excited. Like you're looking for it all the time. My job is to look for risk, but Usually it's a garden variety risk that comes in and reprices a stock or sector or market index. So I'm not obsessed with bull or bear. I wear both hats. But the point is that timing of a top is that story that I'm building. And then I'm like, okay, everyone out of the pool. <laughs> so that's kind of like I, I'm emphasizing that, uh, that show. But there are also themes. So after we had you know, 35% drawdown in, you know, 35 days back in, in that fateful February to March COVID crash, we had a uh, Fed intervention, which followed a, a quarterly options expiration, which was, you know, uh, March 20th. And that's actually the same day I warned time to cover those shorts because we, you know, something's going to happen. The market's going to close <laughs> or something's going to happen, but this is not normal to have this type of volatility. So long story short, Monday, the Fed came in and we had Fed intervention Monday. Options had expired and just we were straight up, right? Hot fire flames. Nobody expected the extremes that we've had. Um, excuse me. I did not expect the extreme reaction that we have had. So now I'm, of course, looking for the next inflection point. But one thing that I was really, really um, convicted about was this theme of paper to things. So we've been in a commodity uh, lows, you know, multi-decade, multi-decade um, commodities on the ground, right? So just there was just no love for commodities. They didn't produce anywhere near the alpha that, you know, the FANG stocks did. So ignore them. So I was very much of the theme that we were definitely going to have a paper to thing rotation, um, which means things would now become more valuable. So let me show you what I mean by that. Hold on. i got to see something right here. And Samantha, just so you know, we are getting uh, uh, some tickers in the chat. So yeah, uh, when you're ready. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. So um, same market feel, same market feel. So um, this was the deal, right? My example was inflation call last summer where I coined and repeatedly said this inflation is sticky, things over paper. And now we have economists coming out and saying, oh my goodness, you know, we have a lot of inflation. So the point is, this is something where you can trade around um, very, very well. And just because we were going to have higher prices did not mean I believed we were going to have higher interest rates and, you know, higher prices for things, but it didn't mean I was bearish equities. This was very much, um, we had an oil shock, we had US dollar was going to get stronger, rate spike was going to get stronger, but the upside catalyst for equity markets advanced. I was still very bullish equities. So when you have that kind of backdrop from a macro standpoint, then boom, you've got a whole bunch of tradable themes and basket trading. You're going to be more bullish than bearish, right? So to come up with actionable trades uh, around themes, to me, 
is basically my value add. That's my thing. And then most of these turned into phenomenal parabolas. So when others are chasing a parabola, my I'm hoping that we're already positioned for it. Um, that's kind of the, the goal. Oops, sorry. So this is what I mean by this things over paper in one chart. This is a bit of my intermarket analysis, but large cap, um, you know, S&P ratio to CRB, which is a commodity index. And you, you can see this back from the 1990s, right? So, you know, honestly, we've had an, an, a hell of an advance in the equity markets. And you can see that here, which is paper over things, right? Commodities on the ground, who cares? Um, and then we had a transition, a really strong transition. And that was basically, I thought, demonstrated beautifully in this one chart. Um, basically the ultimate parabola in my view. So then things started to, to move. We actually got a bid, a strong bid um, in a lot of commodities. Remember that whole, you know, take me somewhere expensive and it was a lumber mill. So lumber took off like hot fire flames and that led to, you know, increased housing values and you could trade XHB. My trade was uh, RFP, which is a lumber play. And at the time it was $4 and I saw it going to 1575. It did. Took a few months. But that's an example of if you have this kind of backdrop of looking for um, relational you know, trades to support a theme, this was one. Um, Bitcoin was also a commodity. It trades very much like a commodity. I don't think of it as a cryptocurrency. I think of it as a crypto um, uh, asset that trades like commodity. But basically buying stock um, first in RFP because it was $4 and it did not even have an options market that was trustworthy, meaning it was young, it was ignored. Who's going to buy RFP? Um, after it doubled, then it literally exploded in um, uh, for an options market. So now it's very easy to trade. Very, It's very, um, you know, more stable. Spreads are tighter. It's more liquidity. Anyway, it was kind of funny. Um, so uh, I didn't plan to get in and make a market, but the point was um, go in before the parabola, right? Same thing with oil. So oil, I think this parabola is still moving higher. And in 2008, right where this yellow arrow is, we had actually a huge supply chain constraint in the uh, OSG market, which is basically the pipes and that broke with deflation on the great financial crisis. But this run up was very, very much based on supply constraints. So it's kind of interesting how this parabola that, that took off in 2008 and then crashed with the great financial crisis. We had another little similar boom drop into negative territory. But once that stabilized, which was, of course, a big, big deal, overreaction. That's an outlier. It's been a phenomenal trade. And I'm not talking, you know, chase time frame, but I'm talking about, you know, swing and trend time frame. So I went and picked my favorite ones and presented them to clients. Um, Sandridge at $2, now $12. CPE, which trades like flat oil. Exxon, Chevron, you know, the, the big majors. The point is, you know, then you can actually have some faith to put in some later dated options. So much of the, the the drama recently has been in this little pullback that we've had, which was also a really nice short fade call that I've had um, with my oil trading uh, buddy, um, Bob McMinn, who is a fundamental oil trader. The point is, this is on a monthly. This chart is on a monthly. Back in March, I had written, um, if it was back in March, if we can get and close above 65, 65 on a monthly, which we did, we can go to 80. If 80, then 100. If 100, 130. This is early. We, I'm completely wrong if we break down below 65, 65, but on a monthly. But the point is, this is still in play. So then it's about trading around a core position or you got a, a, a major trend theme I'm still hot on. But then I know that, uh oh, we got some weakness coming in. President Biden's going to, you know, do anything to get gas down. Well, why fight the man? <laughs> so then finally, we did have, of course, um, six week lows. Um, this week, they just really, the, the floor gave out. But that's honestly, that's the fun part of trading options. If you know the time frame. if you don't, it's very, very painful. 
Most people just chase. Nat gas is another example. You know, that's a parabola event driven. But that's kind of my point is that everyone really wants to be a parabola trader. They want to get in there early and say, OK, what's going to be the next market's, you know, um, love child or what's in supply deficit that we need to get in there and um, bid up uranium was on that last year. Lithium got into that in May. So the point is, there are lots of potential plays that um, that macro backdrop helps me identify for sector rotations that then become durable trades. And then I use the option tactics around it uh, to trade around that core theme. All right. So RFP was an example. Um, BTU for coal. But man, that thing is just poorly run. So every time it gets up to like a, a 200 day, I'm going to just show you that real quick. Hold on. All right. So this is an example of RFP. OK, um, when this was recommended. Right. And then I had literally given 1575. Now it's basing around this 30 week. And if if Neil has seen this before, I like to do a chart on three different time frames, hour for the chases, day for the swings and week for the trends. This so far has based beautifully. This could be very much a continuation trend play, but it needs to get back above 1575. So that's the kind of thing I look at. BTU, which was a phenomenal mover as well, right above this five and a half mark, incredible, you know, bottom fishing play. It moved beautifully. And this 10 week moving average is my best friend. It's yours too. As long as we close above the 10 week moving average, we're still good. What's this orange line? It happens to be the 200 week. That's a price target. Careful, you defend. How do you defend? If you're long the stock or long the calls, sell some further dated calls against it. So that unfortunately not only broke the 10 week, but it's all the way back down to the 100 week. So that's disappointing. This fell apart as a trend trade, if truth be told. And this was the, the that's also kind of know when to get out. So even though this theme worked extremely well for many months, it got rejected at the 200 and came back. What didn't, uranium, which is um, very hot right now, given electrification, that's been a suggestion by my risk manager last summer. Um, and I did a video about this in December. And since this broke out, this has been phenomenal. It did have a very dramatic pullback to the 50 week. Then it broke out again, saved by the 10 week. This is back in trend again. So for me, I'm using trend plays as durable themes. And then I'm using moving averages and fib and trend lines and all the rest to kind of uh, stick with it. Um, or trade around it. And I think that's really important. So I'm still in uranium and CCJ. OK, but these plays have been in for a long time. This was a gap up on a weekly back in December. And literally, this was one of my top four trades for the year um, when I did a, a stock charts uh, TV interview. Um, swings can also turn into trend trades. So here's one that I recommended, which is LAC. Recommended it as a swing here. OK, it, really, you got to have a little bit of patience on some of these, by the way. This is lithium. It pulled back, but stayed above the 10 week. Once it all the way up to this trend line pulled back, it was shallow. Once it broke out, I moved it to trend. So for me, this was a swing because it looked like it was about ready to move higher, like volatility was going to come in and this Bollinger Band was going to you know, get excited. It pulled back. It was pretty dramatic, but it stabilized. That's a fabulous place to buy. It did this another pullback. So the point is, these have options that are, you know, there's no weeklies on this stuff. Forget about it. They're just monthlies. But if you have some chart pattern recognition and you've got a macro theme to back it up, um, LTHM was another is another one. They're still open. This is the same kind of thing, right? This scoop pattern breaks out. It a little overshot the 10 week, but it's still decent. It's not as fast moving. The point is, if you have a macro backdrop, some technical analysis, add in some fundamental stuff, you're going to do fine. So um, I don't know I, which tickers, but for example, on the more hip plays, 
Um, Digital Ocean, I actually use it for my brokerage triggered trade alerts. So I was interested in this when it went IPO. There were three plays that I was very interested in. Um, Digital Ocean, it has done nothing wrong. It has stayed above that 10 week as well. So just keep rolling those options. It is extended now. I am expecting some digestion. What happens typically is it comes back down to the 10 week and as long as it stays there, it's fine. You can see that with Unity as well, which is not a trend play, but you can see how it, you know, then it explodes higher. But the point is, this has done nothing wrong, but I think it it needs to get defended now. INMD has been a trade since this red line broke out, shallow pullback, beautiful. Shook me out only once here. When it got back above, got me back in. The point is, when it got extended, it was literally right before the split. It was uh, 180, exactly. And I warned to clients, be careful, this is extended. It could come back to its 10 um, its ten week. And look at what it did. That particular 90 was really 180 at the time, crashed all the way down to 140 before it based and moved higher. So if you're looking at options, add time, because things often take a lot more time than expected. And if you were not prepared for that, basically that two-week um, very sharp pullback in in mode, which by the way, I think is an explosive growth play for the long haul, which is why it's a trend play, um, then you would have gotten shaken out and frustrated and all that. But it's still, believe it or not, closed above the 10 week. So add time, especially on these trade uh, trend plays. Macy's has been both um, a trend and a chase. And I mentioned this because it just had earnings. This is the only time that I actually hold through earnings is if I've been in it for a while and it's a trend play because I really believe in this theme. So my price target for Macy's was up here around 35, 36. This was before earnings. And the only only interest I had was once it cleared out of this wedge, okay? Once it cleared and closed above and then it did its normal thing, it came back to the 10, broke out a little higher, came back to the 10, broke out a little higher. Now it's an inside week. Ooh, it's getting discovered. And it's not about just reflation trades and forget meme stocks on this. This was an oversold play and it's going to delight. People are shopping again. They got money. So this is what I mean by if you want to try and defend this trend, you're going to have so much work because it has an aura of volatility. It's very wide. So it goes all over the place. Um, Or you can just hold your nose kind of thing. But now that it's up to a monthly trend line, which was my price target, just like RFP, this was my price target. It took a few weeks, but then it, of course, came back down. So now it's time to sell calls against or buy some puts against it. You can still hold on to your core um, position. Does that make sense? All right. So moving along. What to know, um, these parabolas that everyone wants to trade, a little sidebar here on parabolas, because I think it's it's kind of important. Um, folks are so excited about trading these, but they also, unfortunately, um, can lose their, you know, hold their head in their hands because it comes off. So everyone wants to be a parabola trader, whether it's GameStop, uh, Tesla, Avis. Oh, my gosh, there are so many, right? Avis was the car, C-A-R. So... Some of these become freak of nature short squeezes, and then they glom onto a particular theme and hope that it's going to happen again, like AMC. I'm, by the way, not an AMC proponent of going to 100,000 or whatever the price market is, um, price target is for a, a group of traders. I, however, was long GameStop from July of 2020 before Michael Burry came out because it was a bottom fishing play, and I'll show you that. But the point is, this is what everyone's looking for. Get in there before that parabola really takes off. But keep in mind, and I I mentioned this because options go into a squeeze when they get a lot of excitement, that fear of missing out creates a gamma squeeze. And you can see it in the options market. If you stack it, um, you know, by just IV, you can see when it's getting to 200 IV that it's in a squeeze. So above 200 IV, it keeps going, 400 IV. It happens a lot with biotech, but it's been happening also with, um, uh, you know, the Lucids and the, the QS and, you know, name, name, name a SPAC of, of 
excitement. Anyway, the point is this parabola is um, really trapped longs. And a lot of people don't think about that. They're like, what do you mean? Isn't that a short squeeze? No, because all the folks that are getting in last in, first out kind of thing, they're trapped longs or they're folks that have profits and they want to get out safely. So parabolas are trapped longs, not shorts, but FOMO longs, especially the last ones in. Keep that in mind. So you're really kind of swimming against the current. Um, they are outliers right? Standard deviation moves that need that will revert with velocity. And the trick is to wait for the turn. And if you're in it for a day trade, then put it on a five minute chart. <laughs> um, my hour, day, week times time frame is not going to help in a parabola. But um, if you're day, chase, day, day trading, but the, the trick is to wait for the turn and be patient. They revert. They always do. Um, and when you can see the, the, the move happening, it's a liquidation risk, it's volatility, and then you get halts and all that busyness. So just be careful. Predictable uh, parabolas are predictable. They will revert. And then you want to see how they base. So is it going to be, you know, like Bitcoin over time has been rolling parabolas, right? Starts out, goes higher, crashes, goes a little bit higher, crashes. Those are rolling parabolas versus taxi medallions, right? There used to be a business. Um, now there is no more because we have Uber and Lyft. That was a parabola and then it, it's gone. So, or this kind of thing. Oh, hold on. I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, um, so basically trend reversals or or rolling parabolas, just, just know what you're trading, but remember no parabola goes sideways. So this is what I wanted to show you. This is the squid game. This uh, squid game game coin. This was a phenomenal parabola. Oh my God, look at this. It's valued at two trillion. Four minutes later, one million valuation. So that's a parabola that is no more. It just poof, it's gone. So I guess my point of this is when it comes to options, and I'm hammering this point home, I hope, is time frames really matter. So if you have a thesis and you're trading around it for a longer duration or are you chasing you know a, a, a parabola um you're going to obviously tight 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 duration um stock oftentimes is even better than options in a parabola because the iv is so jacked anyway know what your what your time frame is and don't be this guy right the rabbit and the tortoise and the hare and basically takes a little nap dreams about all of his you know diamond holdings um, and such, and then boom, he loses. So that is pretty much as old as time, you know, nursery rhyme, whatever story that is being played out every day and gets lots of attention, right? The citadels and the um, the reddits of the world. But the, the point is, it is real. It's a real. It's a real thing to consider. So my time frames. And this is, you know, leading into kind of what's the system she's using. Everyone has to define their own time frames. So if you are, um, you know, tortoise or hare or somewhere in the middle, you're basically you're going to figure it out. I am very much um, all three. So I have to feel it. <laughs> so, um, you know, for example, this week. Hold on, let me go over this qu quickly. Chases, trades that typically last one to three days, okay? Um, they employ options one to three weeks out and are often based on hourly chart timeframes. I think you probably already figured that one out. Swings, these, for me, my definition, you come up with your own, um, are trades that typically last one to three weeks. They employ options one to three months out, so I'm using the monthlies, um, and they're often based on the daily uh, chart time frame. And then trends, um, they typically last one to three months and they employ options three to six months out. So I'm really adding time there. So for example, when I bought the GameStop in July of, I spied it in July of last year, I bought September options. In September, price had gone up. I bought December options. I'm like rolling that out. And then getting closer, I bought January options. And then in January, I bought April options. So to me, that was still a durable trend that I was just rolling. Does that make sense? So it wasn't going to go anywhere. I still had faith in it. 
It didn't hit my $40 by end of year, which was my which was my call. Actually, it was my four to 40 stock. But the point is, that's why it's really good to add time. It was only twelve dollars in, in January. So I was wrong. It wasn't 40. It was 40 really, really, really soon after it was 240. It was 480. Never expected that. But the point is, choose your time, add time. It, it really matters. So let me just show you a, like a, a few examples like for this week. I think that's kind of helpful. Hold on. All right. So this week, just as a chase idea. OK, I had read a supply side um, note on Okta. OK, Okta was 264. Let's look over here because it's probably easier. So in my trading room pre-market, I had read that um, there were some negative comments on Okta. And if you have remembered uh, what happened to crowd last week, it really it, it, it dropped hard. So it opened literally at 264 and I gave clients my price target of 251. It well, well overshot that, it, it, you know, 240. But the point is I had to have something to go on. And this is why I was very quick to post this um, when the when the room opened because crowd, if you recall, just all of a sudden kind of fell out of bed. Now granted it bounced, but it's still looking pretty weak. So that's basically an example where Okta, which is a short duration trade, I have, wasn't even on my radar, honestly. It was a news item that I trusted that the sell side would probably result in about a 5% dip for that Friday on options expiration. How nice is that? Um, and so basically stock or options, I'm using the news and then price levels. So it opened it, you know, 264 and my price target was 251. Granted, it overshot. That's an example. Um, Apple. Who doesn't love Apple? So this you can do all kinds of things with. But for me, once this got back above 150, it had to prove to me that it could stay above 150. I had a nice look. You know, in time, I believed it was going to go right back up to this trend line. So when was it recommended, though? Right here when it got above this 150 and it ran up to 160. Did I think it would happen in four days? No. So should have had the weeklies that went up like 2000% didn't. Um, so I'm using weeklies that are one to three weeks out. So even if I, you know, say I really like this trade above 150 heading to 160, right? Technically speaking, it looks fabulous. And it's it's staying above each level, level by level. Even I don't even know when this is going to hit, right? Could be next month, could be who knows. So the point is um, anything above 150 price target 160, Unfortunately, you know, options two, three weeks out aren't as impactful as near dated ones, but they are safer over the long, long haul. Um, one thing that I was anticipating this week and posted all of this for clients. So this is no no surprises on this stuff um, and everything's recorded. So, you know, this is all posted 100 percent real time, <laughs> annotated charts, live levels, the whole thing, small caps financials and oil. Those were my short um, chases for the week, actually two weeks. So when this started to roll over, I have some other indicators that kind of alerted me to that. Um, so Wednesday the 10th, we popped up a little bit, couldn't close above and then continued down. And in the pre-market, we hit my price target actually 231.36. And I think Monday we, we, we will continue to go lower. So small caps, is a few weeks. XLF was another one right here. It had a wedge and basically same thought, same idea, which was I think we're going to break to the downside. If small caps are going to go over, they're primarily energy banks, right? Um, and that's why I picked XLF. You can pick an individual bank. They were much more, you know, eventful, right? But the point is, I'm fine with what I'm using and then clients can do what they want. So XLF tanked. Oh, my gosh. And so did the oil. Right. Oil um, basically has been trading down for the past six weeks. It's been very, very soft. So there were lots of ideas. But just to show you in you know chart formation, this is obviously rounded um, XLE and OIH. They were phenomenal shorts. So this is something that I'm putting together based on my theme. And it's a short duration trade. And 
typically using, um, uh, you know, the next month option at the money or a price target of where it's going. So that's actually um, another thing I'll kind of be specific about. So if I think, and I'm very, very convicted that this is going to head down to 236 and then it's going to go to the 21 day um, and then it's going to go down to 231, I want to grab the options, the price of where it's going. So I want either at the money, everyone's different, or where it's going. And I typically go a little bit out of the money. Okay. So there's a little bit more, you know, drama with that. So that is kind of a, a, an idea of when I'm looking at sector shorts, right? That was IWM, XLF, and oil. Um, I'm thinking it's going to happen, you know, in the next few weeks. So I'm using a monthly. If Apple, a, a few weeks out, because, you know, it, it de definitely gets the gamma nod. Um, some of the things, I'm way, way um, not expecting it. So Micron, for example, was a swing idea. I had just posted last week. And this happened yesterday, up 8%. Too bad I didn't have a weekly. I don't care. I still had the right idea, right? Look at this gorgeous breakout on a weekly, closed above the 10 week, stayed above this, you know, 74, which was really important, Meant, went all the way up to my price target. Okay, so I got a monthly. Maybe it's even a call spread, but guess what? It's still working. So I don't, I don't need to have, you know, Friday's expiration. That's just not my, my jam. Anyway, these are um, kind of examples I thought that might be interesting. And then um, specifically, stocks like earnings really, really, really matter. So here's an, here's an idea, something to keep in mind. So I had posted to clients um, Samantha, your mic just got muted. I don't know why. I, I'm reading your lips. Can you check your StreamYard thing? I'm trying to unmute you from StreamYard, but it's not letting me. Oh, it looks like your mic came disconnected. Um, and guys, while um, uh, Samantha is figuring this out, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. We've only got about nine minutes left here with Samantha. I have no idea why that happened. I'm so sorry. Okay. All good. Okay, that's just bizarro. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Riot, for example, is something that I had suggested as long as it stayed above 29.71. It ran hot, hot right into price target, but then earnings comes out, right? This is even before the Bitcoin pullback. I don't like when it's a, a chase or swing to play earnings, like I want out of it. I want to see what is going to happen um, after it, unless I have a theme. Fubo, I had a theme. I was very excited about trading this into earnings. Um, put a 30 by 35, call, uh, yeah, 30 by 40 call spread on that. And I actually, it made like 300%, but I didn't close it. Then earnings came in, they disappointed, they opened right below and that's it. That call spread doesn't work anymore. So you can make mistakes. The, the, the trick, honestly, is to trade in a size that's not going to hurt you if you're wrong. So we're just going to kind of go through a few things quickly. Um, gamma flows, I, I kind of alerted to this a little bit, which is that short termism. It's all about the FOMO chase. Think large institutional buys and sells and then be careful because once that turns negative, we're in a positive gamma flow right now for the market. Selling can be get selling. So keep that in mind. And this is when gamma will start to impact the price. This is Tesla, for example, kind of a nice 45 degree angle if it stayed that way, but then it gets parabolic. So that's when it starts to become a thrill ride until you don't know when to get off. So just kind of keep that in mind um, when it comes to trading parabolas. Flow definitely, definitely happens, um, but then it stops. This happened with GameStop. This was, again, one of the ideas that I had from last summer that went crazy. That particular option went up 163,000%. That'll never, ever, 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 ever happen again in our lifetime. But that's why everybody is excited about it. It's like winning the lottery. It's just honestly, in my opinion, um, a fluke of nature. It's not anything to get excited about. 
But I will point out that this um, is, no, I won't, I won't point out. Okay, never mind. Is, hold on. <laughs> it is fun when it happens. Okay, so the system that I'm using basically identify top chases. Um, and then usually I'm using, like I said, or, um, the weeklies if it's a chase monthlies if it's a swing and then further dated um monthlies and call spreads and the like um around a core position if it's a trend so i'm definitely looking very much at um my indicators you have to kind of come up with yours i'm very much a proponent of you have to come come up with the language that makes sense um so that you can follow it basically and then the you know, you alone define what is short, intermediate, and long for a for duration. So those you know plays that I talked about are some work, some don't. I'm not trading huge size, which is really something that's important um, to me. Hold on one second. There it is. I trade small but frequently, so one to three percent of available equity. I trade momentum both directions, obviously. Um, chases maybe 20% of my book, um, anticipating volatility about 50%. Um, in other words, you know, I really want to see swings behave and that before I move them into trend. Oops, sorry about that. And then I position with value plays. So things that I have a, a thesis about Airbnb, Roblox, um, Digital Ocean, those are trend trades since IPO because I believe in a thesis around those plays. That makes sense. Um, and then they make up about 30%. But in all cases, I'm not risking more than I'm willing to lose. And this is kind of a, my cheat sheet. So what I would recommend is if, if you're kind of new to options, come up with your own. And yes, I deviate from this all the bloody time. But the point is, this to me allows me to kind of, um, you know, stick to a guardrail so I don't go over the edge, I guess is the way to put it. Um, and that is how I can kind of optimize results that are comfortable for me. I like very much to, um, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. And for me, technical analysis is very much that way. Um, so our option tactics that, you know, define your risk. For me, if I'm looking at something that's short duration, I might have a little bit more uh, position size on it if I, if I feel really confident. Um, but in all case, in two days, I'll start small and then build up to it. Um, if it, if I think it's going to happen in, a, 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 sorry, a two-week option, um, I'll add a little bit more and maybe a little bit more. But point is, I have a position size. This, by the way, represents um, a set amount. You know, maybe, you know, traders, for some, it's $1,000. Big Dave in, in Texas, his you know, one lot is 250,000. So everybody is different. But this position size, whether it's a set amount or position of available equity, um, will help you kind of focus instead of you've got your process. Now you can focus on the management. Strike price to me is really important. Can it be achieved within the time frame? So I will absolutely put um, that stop that I don't want it to close below and the profit targets if I'm right. And then, of course, the time frame. Those those three things really, really matter to me. And be honest, like not hopeful, but like, really, what's the market doing? What's that sector doing? What's that stock doing? What's the event? Is there any gamma, you know, um, optionality coming in, uh, you know, so you're going to get lots more um, excitement? The date to me is you know, for what option you trade is a reminder all the time that it's not a game of perfect, right? So it can be wrong, completely wrong. So position size matters. And the more time you add, guess what? If you're right, lower returns, but less risk. So you're constantly balancing that. Um, Delta, you know, for the most part, these out of the money uh, penny options, I never trade. So and I don't like um, low priced stocks. I definitely low priced stocks using option. I'll just buy the stock. So like, you know, four dollars under five bucks. I'm just going to buy the stock. So this is where I think everyone kind of puts together their own option cheat sheet. This happens to be mine um, and I share it 
you know, with clients, I share it with you. And you, especially if you're kind of coming into the into the game. One thing that I will uh, put out there is option trading is very much like chess or checkers. So are you chess or checkers person? Risk reward. Um, I'm a buyer of options. And in a few cases, I will be a seller of options, but I don't really prefer that. That's me. I like volatility and sellers of options are typically looking for that chop, slow directional movement, but not a lot of volatility. I'm looking for the exact opposite. So financed option spreads is a tactic um, because I'm assuming that a lot of folks are learning about, you know, puts and calls and then analysis and technical indicators and scanners and uh, all that good education. Benzinga does such a good job uh, presenting. I'm looking at one particular nuance of option um, tactic that is very much my style for um, a very bullish bent and one that I use for trend trading. It's called financed option spreads. So it's buying, for example, a put spread and then selling it calls against it, for example, or buying a call spread and selling puts against it. So it's a way to finance and it does require... Um, you know, some margin. So it's not for the uh, for the newbie, but a bullish bearish strategy that you have, let's say, for the next few months. Um, you, you don't have so much time where you have to manage it. You're working with decaying options. Um, uh, but I always, by the way, do, do a financed um, spread that is a debit, even if it's one penny. I, I don't start off with a credit. That's me. Um, it. it it has to be still a re don't do it on everything because you're still going to have to manage it, especially if you have to defend it because it you know goes against you. Margin capabilities, depending on the underlying, can be very expensive. But if you're right, you're right by a lot. Just remember, if you're not, you're going to get assigned, and then you you lose that premium that you paid for that spread, for example, and you get assigned the stock at a discount. I'm not afraid of that. Some people are. But here's a perfect example, Gilead. It's literally on my YouTube channel. <laughs> not, not kidding. Arch and I put Arch and I put. She's my trading room. One of my trading room moderators put on this Gilead um, financed call spread. And the next day, there was some announcement. This was last year, COVID related. Things spiked up like seventeen percent. It was a ridiculous freak of nature. Totally didn't expect it. It was three months out, and it was a phenomenal winner. But that is, like I said rare. Oftentimes they just stay there. They don't move very much. Over time they do, if you're right, but you're taking advantage of theta decay. In this particular case, um, it, it, it's just one of those deals where I got lucky. It was, it was better to be, you know, sometimes lucky, good, whatever. So another time, which I had just recently posted on a Bloomberg interview, was a bond um, put spread, finance put spread. And this was all about non-farm payrolls coming up um, on the Friday and then FOMC, September FOMC on Wednesday. And I felt, you know, pretty confident enough to say that I thought bonds were going to sell off. Um, we're going to get a little, you know, yield spike. That's a macro to micro trade. So that particular trade was based on, you know, some, you know, ideas around economics and what the bond traders would do in reaction. And boom, and it literally was one of those deals where I went on TV and said, I would, I think the November TLT, as long as it stays below 153, um, it, it's a really, it's a great finance call spread to put on for scratch, which means zero cost. And it ended up um, a few weeks later being $2. And another week later, it was $3. So that is a more sophisticated option tactic, but I I mention it because it's for real, like really powerful. Um, so that's a little bit, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I wanted to kind of go through how I trade options and um, what I provide, obviously, you know, for anyone who's interested, that kind of analysis, um, education and trade setups, but highest probability, that's basically... I only want select stuff and um, whew, I don't know. <laughs> I want people who want to know why stuff is moving. I really do. I, I really value the folks that that don't just want to take and, and place the trade, but they really want to know why it's moving. And finance call spreads, by the way, um, are not for the um, 
Hint of heart. The uninitiated. Mm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, okay. So Neil, I don't see the question. So is there anything you want to like hit me with? Cause I don't see it. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> we've got about, uh, six minutes here. Um, what do you think about SPACs? Would you trade options on a SPAC? All right. So I'm going to get out of this hole real quick. Where is my, everyone screen cap that off our special deal on the screen. <coughs> you talk to me. What? I, okay. I was talking to our audience. Sorry, I'm supposed to do this. Present. Okay, so here's my, okay, so SPACs. Um, here's my thing about SPACs. When this was raging higher, right, lots and lots of issuance, new SPACs, and I did actually a podcast, one in November and then one in January um, with an investment ban manager who started in SPACs in 2003 and an investment, sorry, investment banker and an investment manager who just traded SPACs. I mean, do his he did his due diligence he knew what was hot and what was not the and he said the supply of issuance is going to be the anchor around its neck and these things are going to come back down to earth um not on the first inter podcast but the second one and sure enough they came all the way back down by the way this is SPAK which is just an ETF but it's kind of good for kind of technical analysis we've had some bounces um you know especially with the kind of EV stuff um, and there have been some fabulous plays. So one that I recommended was Lucid because, believe it or not, my mechanic recommend, asked me about it. And so I started mm -hmm. looking at it going, that's a really good one. <laughs> but the point is, um, this EV, there are some 98%, I think, of SPACs are below their IPO price. Um, they're just hype. But there are some good ones that are very exciting, but they are still no revenue or no product companies of great risk. The thing that I look for is this volume right here. And I do this with my charting platform, but you can do this on any trading platform. You can see when volume comes in, this is the option flow for the day, not open interest, but for the day. When this started getting excited, you know, back here when it kind of gapped up, you could start to see the IV build, you could start to see the option, you know, market build. That's a really good one to go into and chase or swing trade. But SPACs, as a rule, um, literally, maybe, maybe 3% of them are worth, worth the while. Okay, quick question. Thoughts on the big tech fang stocks? Oh, I have I have strong opinions on that. In fact, I've written about that ex extensively for clients. So we clearly have um, um, a market that's being held up by six stocks, right? The Apple, uh, the Amazon, you know, Google, Microsoft, you know, you know, the usual suspects. The point is, that's not healthy when we have such narrow, narrow leadership. At the same time, small caps are obviously coming back down the Russell and, and such. Um, Russell and banks and, and energy, which had been outperforming this year, by the way. So my, um, you know, inclination is to wait and watch for that rotation that will occur. It's not ready just yet um, for that growth to value rotation. So we really need to um, see a turn. Um, I think we're going to start to get it soon where values and cyclicals and the, and the rest start to kind of um, that reflation trades come down with tech. They're doing it right now. The big question is, are we going to have this? This is the small cap, basically. You can see where we broke out and we came right back down. We're retesting. Wouldn't surprise me if we, by the way, gapped down on Monday. I said that um, on Friday and we did. We gapped down on Friday too. But the point is, is this going to be a fake breakout that leads into a fast failure? That's going to be a worry, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's actually going to hurt big tech as well. Um, but this could just be retest and we move higher. This is a year of price um, history. So it could also be seen as concrete. We're not there yet. So let's see how we do next week. We, you know, Fed chair announcement, debt ceiling shenanigans. Um, fiscal got through, you know, House and Senate for the BBB uh, policy. But for right now, um, this has been a, a great breakout and then fade. Let's see what happens. I know everyone wants SPX 5000, which, by the way, this was my price target for this year, 4662. And we tagged it. We went actually through it. And now it looks like I think we're going to come back down. Um, but I'm waiting for the turn. I haven't seen it yet. And when we do come down, it's going to be because tech finally takes um, a pause. 
All right, there you go, guys. Taking a look at IWM, uh, putting things in context for those FANG stocks. Ooh, what do we got on the screen here, Samantha? It's, you know, you got through this presentation. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> basically interest um, in learning more about what I see. Um, I am very excited about helping clients who help themselves. So um, obviously, I have a lot of interest in watching the markets and studying it. I love it. It's just the best board game ever. Um, I'm very comfortable with volatility. I'm not afraid of it. I want to identify the highest probability chase, swing, and trend um, timeframes. I like to, to engage with um, clients when they ask me, what about this? What about that? I've gotten some phenomenal ideas also um, from these very smart clients. Um, basically, this is an offer. If you're interested, it is going to be a great discount for a three-month subscription, $100 off. Um, starting next year, I am going to be launching the Brokerage Triggered Trade Alerts. Um, so price will be going up because I've been spending a ungodly amounts of money on that, but it's going to be wicked cool. Um, and, but in, in the meantime, you know, depending on what your interest is for uh, market knowledge, I probably can cover it. There you go, guys. Um, that's where you find more from Samantha LaDuke. Samantha, thank you so much for being with us at another well, Benzema. It is account. a pleasure. And for those who want to find me a little bit um, online or Twitter, YouTube, Discord, Oh no, Samantha, you can't became disconnected, but 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 those are the her web handles. You can get them uh uh in all of those locations, Discord, everything. Are you back? I'm back. I don't know why it just randomly does that. <laughs> um yeah, you're good. You're good. We caught most of that. Thanks, Samantha. Have a great weekend. You too. Take care, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving.